We're in the 16th chapter of Luke tonight in our New Testament Wednesday night studies. I'm just noticing uh, almost all of the chapter is in red, if you've got a red letter edition. Jesus has a lot to say in chapter 16, then, don't he? And he said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. Somebody took care of his stuff. And the same, the steward, he was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. He wasn't doing a good job. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of your stewardship. We're all going to be called to give an account to the master someday. For thou mayest no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What will I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I can't dig. I don't want to just get... Become a ditch digger, and I don't want to beg because to beg I'm, I'm ashamed. There's not much of that anymore. They're on every corner, ain't they? Amen. In fact, there's a lot of begging in all the stores and burger joints now, too. They've got signs on the door begging for people to work, but there's people on the corner begging for handouts. Amen. I, I, to beg, I'm ashamed, the steward said. I'm in trouble. What am I going to do? I don't want to go to work, and I don't want to, I don't want to beg. He said, I am resolved, verse 4, what to do. That when I'm put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me to their houses. So he, he come up with a plan. Verse 5, he began to see his plan here. So he, he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said to the first, How much do you owe to my Lord? And he said, I owe a hundred measures of oil. He said unto him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write me fifty. Then he said to another one, he said, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said, then take your bill and write 80, four score. And the Lord commanded, commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. He could have just uh, got nothing, but he got what he could, didn't he? He had behaved wisely, and I hold that thought. And then Jesus says something that's uh, as, as true today, I think, as it was in the first century. He said, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Now, that's kind of a bad thing for us to hear because guess who the children of light are? That would be us. He says the world is smarter than the church is in these kind of things. We need to act wisely and act shrewdly. And I say unto you, make yourselves friends of the mammon or the money of unrighteousness that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habita habitations. Now, when I read this last last couple nights ago, I guess, laying in bed, I was reading over this chapter, and uh, I, I read this first story, and, and I, I tell you what, I believe the Lord revealed something to me, that there's something in this for Cleveland Community Chapel. It's the Bible. It, it ain't something just that happened 2,000 years ago, and it's a dead letter. It's the living Word of God, and it's something to say for every child of God and every age in it, ain't it? Amen. But I got to thinking about this, and I said, you know what? The church needs to be wise. And we're living in times, you can say we're living in perilous times, like Paul said, dangerous times, but we're also living in times of, of rapid change. One of the things that the pandemic did is it's caused a lot of change throughout the whole world. It's, it's, revealed, things, uh, it's revealed things in the churches, you know, it's revealed things in, in the world, and everything's different now. It's like you're on the, living in the post-pandemic, and I hope it's always a post-pandemic world from here on out. But I, I've got to thinking and praying about this this week, and I said, you know what? The church needs to be wise. And here's what I come up with. I got to thinking about this and uh, looking around me here tonight. Uh, I'm sorry to say I'm the youngest person in the room tonight, but I believe Donna's got me beat back there a little bit. And, and you know, at our age, we're perfectly content to have church the way we've always had church. I'm perfectly content with you know, but you get to think about it. We ain't reaching this 21st century generation. And you get to thinking about it, it's almost ironic that we continue to sit on 19th century furniture and sing 1930s hymns and wonder why we can't win the 21st century people. And, and most of us Christians, we have a conservative nature anyway. And if you've got a conservative nature... You're, you're slow to change. You don't like change. Change makes you uncomfortable. 
But yet, that's where growth occurs when God gets to trying to nudge us out of our comfort zone. And I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm still just looking at this and analyzing this. But I, that came to me. Uh, I thought, you know, if we continue to uh, behave the way we always have been, we've always done it. That's the seven last words of a dying church. I learned that long ago. I learned that over 30 years ago. The seven last words of a dying church. We've always done it this way. And if the church continues to always do it this way, and this way ain't working, in the 21st century, it makes you wonder, will there be a church in the 22nd century? And I'll echo that with the words of Jesus when Jesus himself said in the first century, when the Son of Man, will, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he returns? It's a legitimate question, isn't it? But I don't know what the answers are. I'm still praying about it, and I'm still trying to get a handle on it, but uh, it's a different world, ain't it? I mean, we're getting squeezed out. The pandemic squeezed us out into the Facebook and YouTube world and kind of thing. You know, you look at that, and we, we look at way you got a handful of people inside the, the sanctuary, but you're supporting a, a ministry that's reaching out to tens of thousands of people, but still, you know, even though I run into people out here and that, hey, you're Pastor Taz from Cleveland Community Chapel. I ran into a, a, one of my family members at the dad's the other day at the cookout. Lives over in another part of the state somewhere and uh, ain't been to church probably in years as far as I know, but he told me, he said, you know, he said, boy, we watch that weekly word. But, but that ain't the end. You know, I'm still trying to get a handle on it. That's an influencer to people, and I'm glad that people are doing that. But that shouldn't be the replacement for church. But how do you get it together? You know, it, it doesn't support the ministry. And, and it's still in the Bible not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. Even the, so much the more as you see the day approaching. But I'm just throwing this out to you, church, to pray about too because as I read this the other day, the Lord commanded this guy. He was, a, he was an unjust steward, but he acted wisely, and the Lord patted him on the back for that. And then the Lord says, you know what? The children of the world, they act shrewder than the children of the church do. Mm -hmm. And that's a word for all of us today to be in prayer that, hey, We've got to examine that. I don't know what the answer is. I, I know I'm supposed to tell you the problem and give you the answer. But I don't know the answer. I just know that we're living in a world that's rapidly changing. And I'm not changing as fast as it is, and you're not either, I guess, because we're conservative church people. And then Jesus says at the end of this story, so he's going to tag on a couple things here too. He says, verse 10, he says, Now, he that's faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that's unjust in least is unjust also in much. That's just a verse that says, Hey, somebody's faithful in a little bit. You can count on them to have a little bit more responsibility and a little bit more responsibility. They'll be faithful. They're laying that groundwork, ain't they? But on the other hand, if, if they cut corners and they're unjust in little stuff, then don't trust them with big stuff either. Because that shows what their nature is. And I've always kind of looked at that in church too. That like, a, you know, they talk about working your way up the corporate ladder out in the world. And the same thing in church work too. You show yourself that you can be faithful in some small job and then you get something bigger and bigger, you know, so you can be trusted with. Verse 11, if therefore you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, if you ain't been faithful with your money, who will commit to you the, the trust, to your trust, the true riches? Which he says, money ain't the true riches. There's something that's true riches. But evidence of your being worthy of the true riches, are you, are you worthy, are you faithful in your money too? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, I don't know, I guess I can interpret that. It's a, we re, we're Christians, we don't really own nothing. Every dollar in the bank we've got, everything we own, it belongs to the Lord. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Well, I thought 10% of it did, preacher. Well, that's, that's, our, that's our tithe, that's our gift back. But 100% of it belongs to the Lord. And I think when we're called to give an account one of these days, we'll have to give an account what we did with the 100% too. Did we use it? Why? That don't mean you can't use it to have fun and enjoy yourself on But... If, if, if you're using it for bad things, then you're going to have to give an account for that, ain't you? Use it to, to honor God in whatever we do. No servant 
verse 13, can serve two masters. Because mm -hmm. then two masters are always going to be in competition about which one's going to be the, the number one, and whichever wins out number one, there's your God. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon's a word for money. You can't serve God and money, but you can serve God with your money if God's your God. And the Pharisees, you know who I read the richest people in Jerusalem was when Jesus was saying this? I thought this was interesting to me. They, they found this out by archaeological digs in recent years. That You know who had the finest homes in Jerusalem? The chief priest. The high religious people. And they were probably in the audience when he's speaking this here. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, greedy, that's one of the commandments, right? Thou shalt not covet. Then there's a long list of stuff, but it's anything, right? You should not have covetousness, which is, I like to define it, covetousness is an ungodly desire. Mm -hmm. If you say, no, I'd like God to have a new truck, that's not necessarily covetousness, but when it becomes that ungodly desire, which Paul says that it becomes idolatry, idolatry then, that's in the New Testament. Covetousness is idolatry. In other words, when you get that desire for it, that that becomes your primary want-to thing and it, and it takes the place of God in your life, then that's the sin. And the Pharisees who honored themselves and wanted everybody else to honor them because they kept the law so well, right here he says, you're breaking the Ten Commandments because they were covetousness, greedy. And they heard all these things. You know what? I, I believe when they heard all these things that the Holy Spirit convicted them of that covetousness too because there's two ways to respond to conviction. You can get right or you can get mad. Mm -hmm. And they got mad. They derided Jesus. They derided him. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. Remember, he talked about that. They liked to pray where everybody could hear them. They liked to dress where everybody would know who they was. And they had all this pride, this hubris, this arrogance in their life. Their, their problem is they're, they're full of hubris, which is one of the worst sins, pride. Mm -hmm. And they're full of greed. But they're supposed to be the religious leaders. And he said to them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. He knows ours too. God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The world's values are not always, in fact, maybe they're seldom God's values. The law and the prophets, that's another way of saying the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, they were until John the Baptist. He was the dot that tied the Old Testament to the New Testament, according to Matthew Henry. The law of the prophets were unto John. Since that time, the kingdom of God's preached, and every man presses in. The law's job was to convince us that we were sinful. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now... The New Testament gospel is an invitation for us sinners to come to God who can make us cleansed and make us right. Mm -hmm. And the law ain't been thrown away. It's still there. It still shows us that we're, that we're sinners. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of that law to fail. And the tittle is the dot that's on the eye. <laughs> they want one dot of that eye changed. Now, the moral law is still in effect. The sacrificial law was fulfilled by Christ on Calvary. That's why we don't keep that law and have to take animals and sacrifice them. He was the Lamb of God that sacrificed for the sins of the world. Now, this is the end of this story, I believe, verse 18, and it kind of seems like, well, here's a verse put in here that's out of place. But I believe it might not be out of place. I believe it may just be in the same story the way Jesus told it here. What, what were the Pharisees that he was dueling with here? What, what was their big thing? The law. They were good at keeping the law. He just got through telling them they're sinners too. You got greedy hearts and you, and you, you love to be seen of people. You got hubris in your life. And, but, but they talk about how great they are being law keepers. Well, they had kind of dismissed this law. One of the things in the first century that 
kind of astounding to me when I found it out. You think the state of marriage today is in such a shambles. Most most marriages, I think, end in divorce now, over 50% of them. Mm -hmm. And you think that's a new thing? But it was a rampant thing in the first century, too. And it was even worse because the man had all the power. He could come up with the flimsiest excuse and write a bill of divorcement and give it to the woman and she was out the door and gone. And if you was a woman and you didn't have a husband, back then you was in bad shape financially really too because there wasn't a lot of jobs for the women. And these Pharisees had probably a lot of them done that kind of stuff and thought that they, you know, they'd come up with their own ideas why it was all right because they were great law keepers. But Jesus said, whoever puts away his wife and marries another commits adultery and whoever marries her that's put away from her husband commits adultery. Now you got to lay that over against other divorce teaching in the New Testament. There are some provisions for that. But I think Jesus puts this here because he's telling these guys that you're so proud of being such good law keepers, but there's one law that you all are neglecting here. And he's just laid layer upon layer upon layer of sin in these guys' lives. But they were the guy who went to the temple and said, I'm glad I'm not like them Gentiles. Remember the Jewish prayer in the first century? Oh, Lord, I'm glad that I wasn't born a woman or a Gentile. I'm glad I'm not like that old guy over there that's beating up on his breast saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, because I do all these things. <laughs> and they were the worst sinners of all. They were, should have been the examples. Verse 19, launch into another story here. Well-known story in the Bible because we actually get a, a glimpse of into the other side. In this case, a glimpse into hell. We get more vivid imagery in the New Testament painted about hell than we do about heaven. And I think that's because, as Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, we can't, we can't comprehend it. We've never seen anything that good. Eyes not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God's prepared for those that love him. So we, we, we just all we can compare heaven with is the best sights and sounds and feelings that we've experienced on earth and then say, but it's better than that. But we actually get a picture of what hell is like in these next few verses. Mm -hmm. Verse 19, there was a certain rich man. He was clothed in purple. He wore the best of clothes and fine linen. And he, and he ate well, he, like us. He fared sumptuously every day. And then the other character in the story is the polar opposite. There's a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at, his, at the rich man's gate full of sores. And he desired to be fed with the crumbs which just fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, now, first of all, I've got to talk about them angels. You know, when we go to the funeral, we go to the cemetery, they've always got people called pallbearers picked out that are going to be the ones who carry the casket and put the person in their final resting place there. Mm -hmm. But that's just the earthly pallbearers. If they're Christians, the angels have already escorted them into the presence of the Lord. They're the, they're the real ones. In this case, it's into Abraham's bosom. We won't spend a lot of time with that, that but here's the, the theory that, that I happen to believe, and I don't say that I've got a corner on the market, but uh, it makes sense to me, as the way it's been explained before, that uh, before Christ died on the cross, sin hadn't actually been dealt with. All the animal sacrifices from the Old Testament were like the promissory notes that the real sinless lamb of God, the human being that was sinless, was coming. And he was represented by a lamb without spot and blemish or some other animal. But it didn't really deal with sins. In fact, that's Bible for you from Hebrews right there that the, Paul says in Hebrews that the blood of goats and bulls could never take away sins. It was just promises that the real blood was coming. And sin is the opposite of holiness, and holiness is what God is. He's the opposite of sin. 
He's thrice holy, as we seen a while ago. Holy, holy, holy. Comes from Isaiah 6, by the way. It's what the seraphim and the cherubim are flying around the throne of God, crying, holy, holy, holy. And because sin could never come into the presence of the pure holiness of God, people couldn't go into the full presence of God yet before Christ died on the cross. So there was a paradise, apparently under the earth, across a great gulf, for you Appalachian people like me, that's a big ditch, <laughs> on the other side from hell. Except it was paradise. And on the other side over here was torments, hell. It was called Abraham's bosom. There's just a few little glimpses in the New Testament that what is he that ascended, first descended into the lowermost parts of the earth, led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. That's apparently what we believe it's talking about. That When Christ died on the cross, he emptied this Abraham's bosom and took him to heaven with him then. It's neither here nor there, but in this story, we've got Abraham's bosom and we've got hell, and it's across a big gulf, big ditch from each other, so they can't cross from one side to the other one. So the angels carried the beggar to Abraham's bosom, verse 22, and the rich man, he also died and was buried, and in hell, he lift up his eyes. Now, here's a few little glimpses that we can find out a little bit in the Bible here just from these few verses what hell's like. He was in torments. Well, we know that much about hell. It's a place of torments. And he sees Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. He sees him across that great gulf and he cried and he said, uh, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Well, it was too late for him to have mercy. He'd had a whole lifetime that God was willing to have mercy on him. But he'd send his life away. He'd send away the day of grace. Now he's in hell and he's wanting to have mercy, but it's too late. And send Lazarus, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he'll dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. There's another glimpse of hell. It's a place of torments and there's flames, and he's in it. His body was buried, but his soul is here. But Abraham said, Son, Remember, now that tells me something about hell too. You still have your mental faculties as a soul in hell. Abraham says, now you remember that in your lifetime you had it good. You had the good things. And likewise, Lazarus had the evil things up there in that world in the lifetime. But, but now the roles have been reversed. He's comforted and you're tormented. And beside all this, Abraham says to the Man in hell says, between us and you there's that great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you can't, neither can they pass to us that we would that would come from hence. Can't get across it from either way. Then he, he here being the, the man in hell again, he said, I, I, I pray thee therefore, Father, and here you got a man in hell praying. He's wanting mercy and he's praying. He had a whole lifetime, didn't he? He said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Because he did remember what he had left behind up there. He said, I've got five brothers. Send somebody that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torments. So he said, well, you can take your memory to hell with you. And here's something that this guy, once he gets to hell, realizes he says, you know what? You can take your family to hell with you too. Amen. He probably remembered the hellish things that they had done and he had been maybe the older brother and he had been influence upon them and he knew that they was headed for the same place. Now the good news is you can take your family to heaven with you too by the influence that you are around them. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul and Silas said to the jailer, and you'll be saved in your family. We're influencing everybody we're around, whether we know it or not, one way or the other one, ain't we? Abraham saith unto him, he's begging somebody to go talk to his brothers, and Abraham says to him, you know, they've got Moses and the prophets. They've got the Bible. That was their Bible in that day, right? Moses and the prophets. They've got Moses and the prophets. Let them, let them hear them. They better listen to that Bible. And the man objects. He says, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. 
And he said, if they hear, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, Abraham said, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now Jesus proved this right later on. Jesus came back from the dead. And there's still a lot of people who wouldn't believe, and there's still a lot of people today who won't believe. In fact, I heard somebody saying something to, it was on the NPR here recently, and they were talking about to Christians that to talk about their faith like it's fact. Now, you got to give them something here, you know, listen to this objectively, you know. And, and a lot of our Christian faith is faith. But there are some things in Christianity that are just plain old fact. It, it is a, a plain old fact that there was a man named Jesus who suffered and died in the time of when Pontius Pilate was governor of Rome, governor of Judea, appointed by Rome. It is a, a, a documented fact that the man named Jesus died on the cross under Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. That's not faith. That's That's fact. You say, well, can you prove it? Well, there's been more things written about that event in history than there have been about George Washington being the first president of the United States. That's facts. You know, that's what we've got, the documented, written evidence from eyewitnesses of the time. But now faith is, uh, you know, I, I believe that, that that man whom we call Jesus is God manifest in the flesh and came back out of the tomb. But not everything is, you know, don't let the, don't play with the devil's hockey puck. A lot, a lot of stuff is documented fact. You know, you've got to make a leap of faith that, you know, we, we can't prove that Jesus is God. We can testify to that, but everybody's got to make their own leap of faith to believe that, don't they? But there's something in verse 31 that says, even though Jesus rose from the dead, it says to me and you, that even though Jesus rose from the dead, if people don't believe the Bible, then they're probably not going to be persuaded. If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It's important that we stand up and believe this Bible. It's faith, I, I, I know. It, it's faith that I, I believe it's the inerrant word of God. I believe that God wrote it through various human beings over a period of about 1,600 years who spoke different languages and lived in different parts of the world. But that alone helps me understand, hey, God's involved in this. Because if it was just men who all did that, boy, they'd be full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. Different languages, different parts of the world, and different centuries. I believe God's hands in it from the first time that the apostles or the prophets or Moses put their hand to the page from the time that the church canonized it and said, this is what we recognize as Holy Scripture. And our faith is based upon this book. That's why you can't be tearing up the Bible and picking what you and what you want to and still expect people to believe in Jesus because they may believe in Jesus and you may believe in Jesus if you don't believe this Bible but you know what? Is it the Jesus of the Bible? Because if it ain't the Jesus of the Bible it may be another Jesus and ain't the one that's going to save you. If they won't hear Moses and the prophets neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. Lord we thank you for the inspired Word of God, may it be precious to us, Lord, as we base not staking our very lives on it, but staking even our eternal souls that this blessed old black back book is the truth of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.